Welcome to the second and last event from our Asian American Colloquium event series of this year. Um, my name is Jing Su. I'm the chair of Council on East Asian Studies, sponsor of this event. Um, our co-sponsor is actually Yale College this year as well. Very happy to have them on board. Uh, we have a really special treat today, and I, I, I'm personally thrilled to have um, our guests here for many reasons. Um, but first, let me give a proper introduction. Um, professor Vian Nguyen, who's here in capacity as a novelist, um, is a professor, uh, of associate professor of English and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He is a Berkeley product, BA and PhD. And today he is here to talk about his novel, The Sympathizer, um, as well as a, a new work that just came out, which is meant to be uh, an academic companion to this novel um, called Nothing Ever Dies, which he will be talking about. The novel Sympathizers has won so much acclaim, it's actually been thrilling and very exhilarating to follow uh, Viet's career since the past year or so. Um, it is on the best-selling list of 2030 newspapers. Um, it's won as the best or notable book of the year from New York Times, Guardian, Library Journal, Publishers Weekly. Um, is the winner of the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, winner of the Center for Fiction's first novel prize, and winner of the Asian Pacific, Asian, um, Pacific American Literary Award. And also was a finalist, I'm very happy to say, uh, for the Penn Faulkner Prize, so on and so on. Um, without further ado, so today our format is going to be um, Professor Nguyen is going to read, do a reading from his novel for about 20, 25 minutes or so, also from his new book. And then he and I will sit down and I'll ask him some questions of my own, but also on behalf of some of the students here who have read his novel only very recently. And then we'll open the floor to general questions and answers around the five o'clock or so. Okay, so please join me in welcoming Professor Viet Nguyen. Well, thanks for that very kind introduction, Professor Xu. Um, you know, we knew each other when we did a fellowship together at the Radcliffe Institute, and that was certainly one of the best times of my life, and one of the reasons why was meeting incredible people like your professor, um, who's had an amazing, an amazing career of her own. Um, so today, what I thought I would do, I'm probably not gonna go for 20 minutes, more like 15, and what I thought I would do is to talk about the novel and also about this other book, Nothing Ever Dies, in the context of um, my relationship to the Vietnam War, which is certainly the, historical event that shaped my life and left its uh, imprint on me. Um, I came as a refugee to the United States in 1975 when I was four years old, and my first memories were actually of arriving in Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, which was one of the four uh, refugee camps that were set up in this country to handle Vietnamese refugees. And my first memories were of being taken away from my parents as a four-year-old and sent to live with a white sponsor family. Um, because no, no sponsors would take our entire family. So that was the beginning of my narrative memory, and that was the beginning of uh, my experience with the Vietnam War. And so I grew up really aware of the fact that this war had shaped my life, and I wanted to try to make sense out of what that meant. So as a young boy growing up as an American in San Jose, California, I read everything I could about the Vietnam War and watched all the American movies about the Vietnam War. And so when it eventually came time to write a novel, um, I wanted to write a novel that would deal with the history of the Vietnam War, but from an angle that I had not seen when I was growing up, which is basically um, the Vietnam War as seen by Vietnamese people of all different kinds of backgrounds. So this novel is my attempt to do that. Um, it's uh, written entirely from the perspective of a communist spy in the South Vietnamese army. He's half French, half Vietnamese. And it begins in April 1975 with the fall or the liberation of Saigon, depending on your point of view. And because he's a communist spy, he does see this event from both sides. Uh, and his mission is to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States, where he's going to spy on their efforts to take their country back. And this really did happen. Well, the first passage I'm going to read, though, deals with something else, which is that when these Vietnamese refugees got to California, if you know anything about Vietnamese people, you know that we love, besides wallowing in misery and melancholy, we also love to sing, dance, and have fun. So they started a nightclub. Uh, and this is actually also true as well. They started a nightclub in Los Angeles in the late 1970s, and this eventually would become something called Paris by Night. How many people have heard of Paris by Night? Look, only a handful. 
Um, but if you are Vietnamese or know anybody who's Vietnamese, you know that Paris by Night is the song and dance extravaganza that is now in about 120 episodes. And it's shot in all <laughs> kinds of exotic locales from uh, Las Vegas to Paris and so on. But it had very humble origins in a nightclub like this. Um, so here it is. Now known by, so the, the, the passage is from, uh, from his point of view, and he's looking at this young woman who's the forbidden fruit, the daughter of his boss, the general. Now known by just one name, like John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Mary, Lana stepped on stage, clad in a red velvet bustier, a leopard print miniskirt, black lace gloves, and thigh-high leather boots with stiletto heels. My heart would have paused at the boots, the heels, or the flat, smooth slice of her belly, naked in between miniskirt and bustier. But the combination of all three arrested my heart altogether and beat it with the vigor of a Los Angeles police squad. Pouring cognac over my heart freed it, but thus drenched, it was easily flambéed by her torch song. She turned on the heat with her first number, the unexpected I'd love you to want me, which I'd heard before sung only by men. I'd love you to want me was the theme song of the bachelors and unhappily married males of my generation, whether in the English original or the equally superb French and Vietnamese renditions. What the song expressed so perfectly from lyric to melody was unrequited love, and we men of the South love nothing more than unrequited love. Cracked hearts are primary weakness after cigarettes, coffee, and cognac. Listening to Lana sing, all I wanted was to immolate myself in a night with her to remember forever and ever. Every man in the room shared my emotion as we watched her to do no more than sway at the microphone, her voice enough to move the audience, or rather, to still us. Nobody talked and nobody stirred except to raise a cigarette or a glass. An utter concentration, not broken, by her next, slightly more upbeat number, Bang Bang, My Baby Shot Me Down. Lana's version of Bang Bang layered English with French and Vietnamese. The last line of the French version echoed Pham Zui's Vietnamese version, We Will Never Forget. In the pantheon of classic pop songs from Saigon, this tricolor rendition was one of the most memorable, masterfully weaving together love and violence in the enigmatic story of two lovers who, regardless of having known each other since childhood, or because of knowing each other since childhood, shoot each other down. Bang, bang was the sound of memory's pistol firing into our heads. For we could not forget love. We could not forget war. We could not forget lovers. We could not forget enemies. We could not forget home. And we could not forget Saigon. We could not forget the caramel flavor of iced coffee with coarse sugar. The bowls of noodle soup eaten while squatting on the sidewalk the strumming of a friend's guitar while we swayed on hammocks under coconut trees, the whisper of a dewy lover saying the most seductive words in our language, anoi. The working men who slept in their seclos on the streets, kept warm only by the memories of their families, the refugees who slept on every sidewalk of every city, the sweetness and firmness of a mango plucked fresh from its tree, the girls who refused to talk to us and who we only pine for more, the men who had died or disappeared, the streets and homes blown away by bombshells, the streams where we swam naked and laughing, the secret grove where we spied on the nymphs who bathed and splashed with the innocence of the birds, the shadows cast by candlelight on the walls of wattled huts, the barking of a hungry dog in an abandoned village, the appetizing reek of fresh durian that one wept to eat, the sight and sound of orphans howling by the dead bodies of their mothers and fathers, the stickiness of one's shirt by afternoon, the stickiness of one's lover by the end of lovemaking, the stickiness of our situations. And while the list could go on and on and on, the point was simply this. The most important thing we could never forget was that we could never forget. So memory and forgetting are big themes in the novel and in, in the, um, the nonfiction book that I'll talk about in just a minute. And certainly when I was growing up, um, I was very aware of how Americans were remembering and forgetting the Vietnam War, and, I, and that was primarily through watching a lot of Hollywood movies about the Vietnam War. So there's a 
big chunk of this novel that deals exactly with that, with um, a satire of what looks like Apocalypse Now, but which is really a compendium of all these Vietnam War movies that I had grown up watching. So one of the other things that happens to the narrator is that he gets a job, and one of those jobs, that, that job is to be the authenticity consultant on the making of a Vietnam War epic to be shot in the Philippines. So in this next bit that I'm going to read, he meets the director of this film, who's known only as the auteur, and a couple of other characters are going to appear, the general and the general's wife, madam. After I descended from the auteur's home to the general's, I reported my first experience with the motion picture industry to the general and madam, both of whom were infuriated on my behalf. My meeting with the general had gone on for a while longer, mostly in a more subdued fashion, with me pointing out that the lack of speaking parts in a, for Vietnamese people in a movie set in Vietnam might be interpreted as cultural insensitivity. Do you not think it would be a little more believable, I said, a little more realistic, a little more authentic for a movie set in a certain country, for the people in that country to have something to say instead of having your screenplay direct, as it does now, cut to villagers speaking in their own language. Do you think it might not be decent to let them actually say something instead of simply acknowledging that there's some kind of sound coming from their mouths? Could you not even just have them speak a heavily accented English? You know what I mean, ching chong English? Just to pretend they're speaking in an Asian language that somehow American audiences can strangely understand? The auteur grimaced and said, very interesting, great stuff, loved it. But I had a question, what was it? Oh yes, how many movies have you made? None, isn't that right? None, zero, zilch, nada, nothing, and however you say it in your language. So thank you for telling me how to do my job. Now get the hell out of my house and come back after you've made a movie or two. Maybe then I'll listen to one or two of your cheap ideas. Why are we so, so rude, Madam said. Didn't he ask you to give him some ideas? He was looking for a yes man. He thought I'd give him a rubber stamp of approval. He thought you were going to fawn over him. When I didn't do it, he was hurt. He's an artist, he's got thin skin. So much for your career in Hollywood, the general said. I don't want a career in Hollywood, I said. Which was true only to the extent that Hollywood did not want me. I confess to being angry with the auteur, but was I wrong in being angry? This was especially the case when he acknowledged he did not even know that Montagnard was simply a French catch-all term for the dozens of Highland minorities. What if, I said to him, I wrote a screenplay about the American West and simply called all the natives Indians? You'd want to know whether the cavalry was fighting the Navajo or Apache or Comanche, right? Likewise, I would want to know, when you say these people are Montagnards, whether we speak of the Brew or the Nung or the Tay. Let me tell you a secret, the auteur said. You ready? Here it is. No one gives a shit. He was amused by my wordlessness. To see me without words is like seeing one of those, one of those Egyptian felines without hair, a rare and not necessarily desirable occasion. How could I be so dense? How could I be so deluded? I naively believed that I could divert the Hollywood organism from its goal, the simultaneous lobotomization, and pickpocketing of the world's audiences. Hollywood did not just make horror movie monsters. It was its own horror movie monster, smashing me under its foot. I had failed, and the auteur would make the Hamlet as he intended, with my countrymen serving merely as raw material for an epic about white men saving good yellow people from bad yellow people. I pitied the French for their naivete in believing they had to visit a country in order to exploit it. Hollywood was much more efficient imagining the countries it wanted to exploit. I was maddened by my helplessness before the auteur's imagination and machinations. His arrogance marked something new in the world, for this was the first war where the losers would write history instead of the victors, courtesy of the most efficient propaganda machine ever created, with all due respect to Joseph Goebbels and the Nazis who never achieved global domination. Hollywood's high priests understood innately the observation of Milton's Satan 
that it was better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. Better to be villain, loser, or anti-hero than virtuous extra, so long as one commanded the bright lights of center stage. In this forthcoming Hollywood trompe all the Vietnamese of any side would come out poorly, herded into the roles of the poor, the innocent, the evil, or the corrupt. Our fate was not to be merely mute. We were to be struck dumb. So I had a lot to say in the novel, but then after I finished the novel, I realized I had more to say. So I wrote another book called uh, Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War. It's a cultural history about how the Vietnamese, the Americans, the Cambodians, the Laotians, and all the Southeast Asian diasporas in the United States have remembered this war over time. And it's really, I, I, I took everything that I learned from writing fiction about dealing with emotion, feeling, um, rhythm, narrative, themes, and put it into the writing of what I had thought would be a narrowly academic study when I started 13 years ago, and which then grew into what I'm thinking of as a cultural history that's aimed for both a general audience and um, a scholarly one as well. So I'm just going to read a paragraph from the, from the prologue, and that'll give you a sense of how the book is written, uh, and it'll give you a little bit of insight perhaps into how or why The Sympathizer was written too. So there's a little bit of my autobiography woven throughout Nothing Ever Dies. I was born in Vietnam, but made in America. I count myself among those Vietnamese dismayed by America's deeds, but tempted to believe in its words. I also count myself among those Americans who often do not, not, do not know what to make of Vietnam and want to know what to make of it. Americans, as well as many people the world over, tend to mistake Vietnam with the war named in its honor, or dishonor, as the case may be. This confusion has no doubt led to some of my own uncertainty about what it means to be a man with two countries, as well as the inheritor of two revolutions. Today, the, Amer the Vietnamese and American revolutions manufacture memories only to absolve the hardening of their arteries. For those of us who consider ourselves to be inheritors of one or both of these revolutions, or who've been influenced by them in some way, we have to know how we make memories and how we forget them so that we can beat their hearts back to life. That is the project, or at least the hope, of this book. Thank you. Take that one. OK, take it. I think that is a better view. That's a better view, OK. Better lighting for you. Thank you for that, Viet. Um, I actually have quite a few questions, but to start, you know, the Vietnam War is very resonant for our generation, but I think for a lot of our young readers here, um, it is not so clear why it was important, uh, why it's such a difficult history for America to come to terms with, as was Vietnam. So I was wondering if you could just start by just telling us what it was and what was the significance of this war. Well, the way that I think about it, the reason why it's important for Americans is that um, Americans have remembered this <clears throat> as a civil war in the American soul. I mean, it was obviously, from my perspective, a war that was deeply meaningful for Vietnamese people of all backgrounds, for Cambodians and Laotians too, because the war spilled over into those two countries, instigated by both Vietnam and the United States and Soviet Union and China. So from my perspective, um, the war was a global war. It was really a condensation of the Cold War into this particular region. And what I argue is that it's also one episode in a, in a century-long history of American expansion that began in 1898, went through World War II, uh, the, uh, the Pacific, Korea, Vietnam, and now into Iraq and Afghanistan. So that's my argument, and nothing ever dies. But for the United States, the way, the, the way that it's been remembered has been in a much more narrow fashion, that it was really a war that took place from the 1950s to 1975, then it was over. But during that time period, it was a war that was vastly divisive for Americans. And that's how they've chosen to remember it. So they choose to remember it as a war that cost 58,000 American lives, which is a real human tragedy. But they've forgotten that it's a war that also cost 3 million Vietnamese lives of all backgrounds and 3 million Cambodian Laotian lives too. And so that's the dynamic of memory and forgetting for Americans about this particular war, that, the, that, that Americans have been able to focus very intensely on their own experience at the expense of forgetting what the war has meant for Southeast Asia. Um, you know, there are many ways in which the Cold War 
the, the rivalry between the former Soviet Union and the United States had completely transfigured parts of Asia, including these splits where you have North-South Korea, um, in, indirectly the communist national split on the mainland China and Vietnam. Um, and it seems that you know, there is, apart from the historical duality or polarity that's created, you know, this idea of doubleness and, of course, as we know from being good students of Asian American mm -hmm. studies and thinking about identity, that's very also key to your novel mm -hmm. um, from simply being a, a bastard, mm -hmm. like half French, half Vietnamese, um, to double legions, double roles, everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could just talk a little about that, about how that particular narrative device was useful for you. Because if I can just add one more, it's that you know, recently a number of Asian American writers have opted to write about spies. Right? There's Susan Choi, which is based on Stora Win Ho Lee, um, and then there's Ha Jing's Map of Betrayal. But in some ways, your novel really, it's not just that you're talking about as such, but your character really inhabits it. So I was wondering how you could tell us about that as part of the writing process. Well, I, when my, when basically my agent said, you have to write a novel. I said, fine. I always wanted to, I'm gonna write a, and I wanted to write a spy novel, partly because it allowed me to deal with history, because there really were spies in South Vietnam who rose very high in the hierarchy, partly because I really liked the spy novel genre, and I wanted this book to work as a genre book, too in addition to being a so-called literary novel. But then also, I had these literary ambitions where I wanted to get at these questions of what it means to be, to have a, of a feeling of duality. And partly it's in response to what you're saying, which is that the Cold War produced this feeling of duality. Um, and now, with the, the so-called war and terror, that feeling of duality has been transformed into a confrontation with a different kind of other. So now, you know, we're all, we're focused on radical Islam and so on, and the fear of communism seems positively quaint today. But if you were growing up during this time of the Cold War, it was really intense. And it really produced this binaristic vision of the world where, there, where you were either on one side or the other. But for so many people, they were caught in between. Like in Vietnam, there were so many people who did not fit easily into either side of this Cold War split. And they were the people who got run over, basically, during the war and after. So I wanted to capture that sense, uh, but not simply to talk about it externally, but to have someone who really embodied that split. And so the spy role was perfect for that. But you know, also as someone who's growing up as a refugee, an immigrant, and as an Asian American, I certainly felt that duality too, that I always felt as if I was observing. Both in my own home, I was an American observing my Vietnamese parents. And then outside, I was a Vietnamese observing Americans. And then I never lost that sense of duality no matter where I was. And so the, the experience of the spy really allowed me to speak to that personal sense of duality as well. And as you were hinting at, I think that's an experience that I think many Asian Americans in general have felt at different part times in their lives when they, have, when they have felt themselves to be the outsider, no matter where they happen to be, whether it's domestic in their own homes or whether it's in their workplace or in their professional lives and public personas. I want to pick up on that a little bit. Um, in one of the interviews that you did recently, I think it was um, Tavis Smiley, you talked about how, as you said, you came at the age of four um, you were taken from your family, but you, you were separate from your family. You lived with a white sponsor family for a while, and then you were, you were reunited with your family later. Um, so in some parts, you know, you're, you're not one of the Asian Americans who never lived through that particular history in the home country, but you also caught the tail end of it, and then your parents didn't talk about when you were growing up. So this is, you know, this is a, the phenomenon we all know well, where you know, children tend to, they inherit what their parents could not say, and that becomes, in some ways, their own sense of um, challenge or their own sense of um, uh, unsettledness, like mm -hmm. a nameless history that they think they're part of, but they can't put their finger on it. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking how that might have motivated your writing, because you also, it, I, I'm sure it's, it's a shorthand to just explain to people, yes, you were a Vietnamese refugee. And, but I was wondering how, four, at, the, at the age of four, you didn't know that. So I'm wondering when you made that transition to that particular mode of consciousness, and then from that to this stage where you feel you want to write about it. Mm -hmm instead of just a question of figuring out who you were from watching Hollywood films and reading while you could. Yeah. Well, there was both that internal and external pressure happening. So you, know, you could not grow up in the United States as a Vietnamese American without being aware, again, of Hollywood movies. Everybody I've talked to has said, yes, we saw Apocalypse Now or Platoon in the movie theaters, and it was a weird experience, you know, to feel this kind of split happening. Because I, you know, I, was, I would love watching World War II movies, for example, and cheering for the Americans. Well, the problem with watching a Vietnam War movie is you're cheering for the Americans until they kill the Vietnamese people and suddenly you're in an impossible situation as a Vietnamese person. And in my own home, um, 
My parents did sometimes speak of the past, you know, not enough, but enough to make me know that this was a real history for them. And for example, you know, when I was growing up, if I did something wrong, they would say, hey, you better be happy that we're not in Vietnam anymore because if, you, if we were, you would be sent to Cambodia to fight in, the, in this war. You know? So instead of bogeyman stories, it would be, you'd be in Cambodia getting blown up by a landmine. That was kind of my childhood. And things like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was very aware of things that were unsaid because um, I have an adopted sister that we left behind when we fled. And we had one picture of her. And I grew up looking at that picture of this beautiful young woman. She was 16 when we left and having no idea who she was. And that was just one symbol of how the past came to haunt the house. And periodically the past would come to haunt the house when things like, you know, my grandparents would die. My parents, my father left the North in 1954 and left his parents behind. He wouldn't see his, his brothers for 50 year, 40 years. And that's very painful, you know. And I just sort of got a sense of that when I was growing up, not really comprehending what they were feeling when they were, when they were, when they were crying and, and mourning their parents, but that, I absorbed that, and I think that's part of the emotional material that I had to mine for the novel. And when did you start going back to Vietnam to visit? Uh, um, I went back in Vietnam 2002 for the first time, which is sort of late. My parents went back in the early 90s as soon as diplomatic relationships were reestablished. And that was a, sort of a difficult time to go back, you know, and my, my parents who had grown up, who had, they had always told me we were 100% Vietnamese when I was growing up. After the second trip to Vietnam, I bet my dad came back and during Thanksgiving he said, we're Americans. <laughs> so, um, and that's a very common immigrant experience. You know, you grow up and you, you, ha you don't go back to your homeland and you have this very uh, particular notion of what it means to be of, your, of this particular background and it's a static notion. And then you go back to your origins and you realize things have changed or you realize they haven't changed and you have changed, or both things are happening at the same time. Um, but I think it was really hard for me to go back. I mean, I had a lot of fear about going back to Vietnam, so it took me a long time to do that. And so uh, the first time back, I just went back as a tourist, and then the second time back, I went back as a student of Vietnamese language, and then I went back many more times over a decade to do research. And I have to say, it was not a, a, like going back to the motherland and feeling Vietnamese. If anything, I went back and I felt, I'm not that. Vietnamese compared to these, these people who, uh, who had never left. I remember, actually, when I asked you about 0809, I just remember this now that you, know, you were telling me you go back and there's this, this expectation you have to bring all these presents for mm -hmm. all your relatives, and mm -hmm. it's like 20, 30 different relatives. Mm -hmm. So that was a very interesting thing to think about. So now, almost, I guess, six years later, mm -hmm. with you having written this novel already. Um, there's so many ways in which one could pivot from the premise of this novel. And of course, the, the, the focus front and center is really about being Vietnamese in America and Vietnam in America. Um, but I was wondering if we could shift our focus a little bit to talk about what the Vietnam meant war in Asia, right? Not mm -hmm. even just Southeast Asia, but that it was really the ground on which um, the major Cold War powers, so we did a little joust, like the way, the way they did in Korean War, mm -hmm. and also relation between Vietnam and China. Mm -hmm. like, can you just talk a little bit more, more about that? Yeah, I think for the Vietnamese people, this is a real history. I mean, the American War was sort of an inter interruption of a much longer history of, of struggle in Southeast Asia with China and with the other neighbors and so on. And we see that now with the fact that the Pacific pivot of the Obama administration is pivoting back exactly towards Vietnam and the South China Sea, which was the territory of this war in the first place. And that really makes you reconsider the Vietnam War in this, in this global context, that, it was, that besides being a war of independence and liberation and so on for the Vietnamese people, it was also a war for establishing global strategic interest on the part of the Soviet, Soviet Union and China versus the United States. And so the United States, you know, the reason it staked so much interest in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia was not only because it had an interest in these particular countries, but because it saw that it had, um, it wanted to protect it's part of Asia for the development of capitalism. And, and this has begun with the American occupation of Japan, right? America wins the war in the Pacific, occupies Japan, rebuilds it into a capitalist power that is its ally in the Pacific. And in order to protect Japan, it has to build a bulwark around it to prevent communism from reaching Japan or other Southeast Asian nations. And this is why the war in Vietnam was so important. And that was also why China and the Soviet Union were also interested in Southeast Asia as well. And so with the, the, the end of the Vietnam War, even though the United States is no longer there, these interests have come back. So that both China and the United States are still struggling 
over this area as a focal point of conflict for their different national interests. Yeah. Um, there's this, you know, this is a, the, the sentiment of brotherhood is very right throughout the novel, of course. The three men with this unbelievable friendship and the very unexpected twist at the end. But this more, one could scale it up and think of this. This is also a particular moment with the idea of a third world alliance, which people don't talk as much now, was really alive and well. There's a real aspiration and belief, right, in the, in the sense that, in, in the idea that Asia, Latin America, and Africa were really going to rise up, right? We think of the Bandung Conference. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I see in your novel very much a gesture towards that. Is I think the, the, almost like the ideological, the romantic, ideology in a novel is very much suffused with, you know, Marx and who I know you, you read and, you know, this type of thinking. So I was wondering how you, um, but I don't hear it come up very much in the interviews that you ha have done, or maybe you're in, the people who I interview have not picked that up. So I was wondering how you fit that in here, because it's almost, again, it's back to this double, du this duality, right, mode where you're addressing on one hand, just this very, the Vietnam, the history of Vietnam War, which is enough, sort of sufficiently complex in itself. But then there's this whole other half of it too that you don't address in this particular context. But I was just wondering if we could ask you to share with us. Well, the novel, I mean, part of the spine of the novel is this brotherhood, this relationship between our narrator and his two blood brothers or best friends, Man and Bon. And the, actually, the, the impetus behind that was um, when I was growing up, I noticed that my Vietnamese male friends, we were all very much into brotherhood, blood brotherhood, which meant forming gangs when we were in the second grade. I mean, literally, we had <laughs> gangs in the second grade fighting against other Vietnamese gangs. Um, very sort of um, uh, innocuously, but, um, but then when I was growing up, I also watched a lot of Hong Kong um, gangster films, Hong Kong films. And That'll see, do it. And, and there's that intense homoerotic, homosocial, brotherhood in there between good guys and bad guys, and that was definitely informing the vision of this trio. The banding stuff, the whole idea of, of, of third world struggle and liberation and so on, that was certainly something I was aware of. It, it was not that explicit in this book, but it was explicit in my thinking about how to frame the book. And in Nothing Ever Dies, I try to make that much more explicit, because I talk about, one of the things I try, I really you know, want to try to stress in, in that book is the importance of a sense of shared suffering. Um, Vietnamese people, but I mean, American people too, and everybody, they, we don't want to share our suffering. We want to believe that any, any kind of terrible experience that we've been through is uniquely our own and makes us uniquely different from other people. But it's the notion of being able to build an affinity with other people's suffering and oppression and exploitation that's really the, the beginning of political consciousness and political alliances that are really critical. So that's true in terms of looking at uh, <clears throat> Writers like Juno Diaz, for example, who footnotes the Vietnam War in the brief wondrous life of Oscar Wilde. There's a moment where he talks about the American invasion of the Dominican Republic, and then in the footnote he says, so then these troops were sent immediately to Saigon to begin an American invasion, and, that was, and we were Iraq before Iraq, talking about the, the mm -hmm. Dominican Republic. So I point to writers like that who are also very explicitly thinking about the possibilities of shared suffering post-colonial alliances of building historical connections that are submerged in the American consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, many of these students have read your novel just very recently, and we focus on chapter 11 in particular, also be it's the middle of your Hollywood extravaganza, and um, there's a passage that was very clever, it's actually about um, the definition of a mole. When the protagonist first heard about that, this would be his assignment. He wasn't sure what it was. Is it an animal? Is it like a part? Is it like a, is it a mole? Mm -hmm. So I found that really interesting because one of the things is that it's, um, it's about how to be in broad daylight mm -hmm. and be able to conceal yourself. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is very resonant of what we know and learn and absorb about what it means to be an immigrant. Mm -hmm. right? One of the first thing you do is that you figure out how things work without mm -hmm. being in the know. Mm -hmm. So you learn how to pose, and you learn how to imitate. You men, how to, you know, you can walk, to, you know, they walk to walk and talk to talk, but you're always at a distance, mm -hmm. right, from what is going on. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I pick up on that in your novel, where it doesn't matter what. I mean, of course, I should say you're a protagonist, but that's what's also really clever about this protagonist, who's a double agent. There's a lot that, as an author, I imagine you can disavow mm -hmm. by speaking through mm -hmm. um, a double agent like that. Right. Um, so I was wondering if I could ask you to talk a little more about, you know, in, it's, it's, it's this play, I, I, 
I hesitate to press you on this because it's, it's this idea of what, what do you think you actually bared in this novel that you don't think people have noticed? What if, if I bared anything? that people have Yeah, noticed? what is something that you think is in, just in plain sight in the novel, <laughs> but you don't think anyone has picked up on it yet? Wow, that's a, that's a tough one. Well, I mean, I think you've already picked up on it, which is that on the surface, the novel is not autobiographical, which you'll all be relieved to know, right? Um, <laughs> given that he's an alcoholic, a liar, a womanizer, murderer, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, but it is autobiographical in the sense of what you're talking about, which is autobiographical in, in an emotional and a political way, which was that I, I did want to write a novel that was not autobiographical on the surface because a common knock against minority writers or immigrant writers is that we write what we know. So we write the family drama, for example, and I didn't want to do that. Uh, so the spy novel plot was just a, a, a narrative that would distract from that. But I also wanted to write a novel that would allow me to say a lot of things that were on my mind. And that meant coming up with a character who could plausibly say these things and it wouldn't simply seem as if the professor was coming in to give you a lecture about various kinds of things. So I constructed this character who would have this kind of a background that would give him the kind of consciousness to be, a, to be observant and to have all these kinds of political comment, comments that he could make. But that sense of the, of the duality that you're talking about of being a mole in, out in public, I mean, that's pretty much what it feels like for me to be um, a minority in American society, like you're saying, or a minority in academia. There's so many, been, there have been so many occasions where I've walked into a room and I look around and I realize, oh, I'm the only non-white person in this room. So I better not make a big deal out of it, um, even though I'm both visible and invisible at the same time as a minority in that context. So that, to that, that is part of, where, of, of the autobiography that makes its way into the book, that I had to, ex I had to exaggerate all of these feelings that I've had about being invisible and hypervisible, about being a, a mole in American society, and trans transmute them into this much more exciting action figure of the spy. Mm -hmm. Now, if I could ask you, this, as you said, um, you know, this novel is meant to be entertaining and dramatic. I think the way is to catch people's attention so they start understanding and you draw them into the significance and the pain behind this. Um, so what is it about the novel in itself, that was, you said that you realized you had more to say. So what was insufficient, you think, about having put it in a sort of fictional voice as opposed to the companion that just came out, mm -hmm. right? Nothing Ever Dies, which you can get a copy later mm -hmm. today. Um, what, what do you think was unsaid that you wanted to recapture or say again in a different way? Well, I, well, I mean, the novel only, can only do so much because it's written from our protagonist's point of view. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, I really loved writing this novel. I had two years and I wrote the novel and I, for most of it, I was having a great time. And then at a certain point, about two thirds of the way through, I realized, oh my God, he's a misogynist. And I'm enjoying writing from the point of view of a misogynist, <laughs> a womanizer, someone who, who objectifies women. But there's no way out of that because I've already committed to this first person <laughs> point of view. I can't step out and say, you're a misogynist. Or, I'm a misogynist, it's awful that I'm doing this. So I had to persist in that <laughs> vision and it, it leads to a very awful and terrible ending, right? Which, um, you know, people have, have rightly felt, some, some readers have rightly felt upset about. Like, did I have to do this at the end? Did I have to lead to this particular atrocity? Did it have to be a woman? Did it have to be rape and all of that? So, in my mind, it had to be. I mean, there was a real reason why it had to be this particular atrocity directed against a woman. And so I had to write the nonfiction book, I mean, to make that explicit. I had to explain why I thought that rape was just as critical as uh, combat to the experience of war. And couldn't say that in the book. You can't have people step out and say, you know, rape is something that, that, that always happens in war. It's fundamental to what brings us to war. It's fundamental to what makes people kill each other. And it's unavoidable, it's inescapable, it's absolutely inter intertwined with combat, but only men get remembered for their trauma. Women don't, or men, any rape victims, male or female, don't get remembered for the trauma that they experience in war, even though that trauma is fundamental to the nature of war and we disavow it. So I talk about that very explicitly in Nothing Ever Dies, along with a bunch of other stuff. So I needed to have that book to be the, the scholar and the professor that I am to, to um, talk about, in general about why war endures, endures in our memory and why we choose to forget it in certain ways and justify it in other ways that I couldn't do in the novel. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm, I'm actually uh, really glad you 
segue into that because one of the passages that our students asked is actually about the portrayal of women, mm -hmm. where they deal feel, some of them did feel uncomfortable. Um, I think in some ways you try to mitigate that by when the agent, when she w was about to be raped, she said, they asked her, what's your name? She mm -hmm. said, first name Viet, last name Nam. Mm -hmm. right, so this is a, a sort of reverting back to the idea that you know, in times of war or the the rhetoric under which you know vengeance or violence carried off is that your your motherland has been raped and you need to somehow avenge her. Mm -hmm. um, that's very that's very prominent. Um, but can you talk a little more about? Um, actually, one question I had was, you know, after all, we are talking about a protagonist who has been violent, right? Is an assassin. Um, why do you decide to make him a bystander? A, a, a bystander as opposed to a participant in this horrific scene. Because what he recalled in the end is that I should have done something, that's the guilt. Mm -hmm. But then it seems to be too consistent with all the kind of guilt. He like, also killed uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the sergeant. And what, mm -hmm. So that's, that's sunny and all sort of rolled together. But there was, so there was something about the treatment of that mm -hmm. last scene, right? Mm -hmm. Where I imagine it was also kind of jarring to you to mm -hmm. write. So can you tell us about <laughs> actually how you wrote about it and whether that was one of the most difficult parts of the novel for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, def it was definitely that and the torture sequence were obviously the most, the, the most difficult parts of the novel to write in, from an emotional point of view or in, the point of view of inhabiting the character. It was actually not the most difficult scene to write in terms of the technical stuff. The, the, mm. the most difficult parts technically had to do, had actually came earlier, but that's a separate issue. Um, so rape is, is something that uh, we can't, reconcile with as a society. You know, when we go to war, we know that terrible things happen. We say war is hell, and we send off people to go and fight, and they come back, and we know that they might have done things like kill people or other terrible kinds of atrocities. But all that is actually reconcilable within nationalist and patriotic narratives, right? Because we know that when we send young people off to fight war, terrible things are going to happen. So we can justify that under certain kinds of narratives of heroism and, and all, all that. But we don't have any narrative that can justify rape. Like, we can't have, welcome people back into the fold and say, well, you know, there's no logical explanation for why a soldier would go and rape somebody. So for if my narrator had done that, that would have transformed him into a completely different kind of person. It would have made him much more difficult to accept for audiences. Already, by page 50 or page 100, my agent had said, he's not a very likable character, is he? You know, he was like, well, if he was actually a rapist, he would be a completely unlikable character. <laughs> which can be done. Um, you know, one of the novels that really scarred me as a youth when I read it was um, Close Quarters by Larry Heineman. And that scarred me because of a rape scene in that book where um, our, 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 hero, our young, white, average American guy who's really a decent person goes to war in Vietnam and becomes a killer and a rapist. And Heineman portrays that unflinchingly. And that's a really difficult thing to acknowledge and to confront. And it's very hard to, like, this narrator, and he does it in another novel too called Paco's Story. But um, that, it's not that I couldn't have done that, it just would have been a very different narrator. And I, and I wanted- Difficult to redeem him. Difficult to redeem him, and plus I wanted to bring up the question of complicity. Because for me, it's, yes, it's terrible to do things and be the actual agent of terrible things, but for most of us, the way that war affects us, especially in our contemporary American society where very few people are in the military, the way that war really matters to us is complicity. You know, we have been fighting a perpetual war for decades now, and we're all complicit with it. And that is the most difficult thing to confront. It's not that war is hell. We make all kinds of movies about that, and we have all kinds of speeches and stories about that. We don't have narratives about our complicity in warfare, which is what actually allows war to take place. And so that's something I deal with more explicitly, and nothing ever dies. And here, symbolically, in this moment, when he's complicit with this horrible thing, and he can't acknowledge it. It takes him the entire length of his confession before he's finally able to confront that. Is there something that, I mean, now looking back, even though it's still very fresh, that you wish he had done with the novel, right? Now that you actually had an academic version of it as well. Well, I don't know, I think. We don't want to give ammunition to any of your critics, although so far, as far as I can see, you don't have any critics. Well, I will tell you that um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I believe in criticism. I'm a critic, and I believe that if, if I can dish it out, I should be able to take it, too. So I've read every single comment 
that's been written about this book on Amazon.com and Goodreads, and that's an exercise in masochism. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like I should, you know, and there, and there are quite a few criticisms that, that have been lever uh, leveled at the book from readers who are not professional critics, right? So we can talk about all that kind of stuff. But, so I know that there are things that some people might consider to be flaws in the book, like pacing, or I don't know, I don't know what else. But I couldn't, even, even if I could have a chance to rewrite the novel, I, th I don't think I could. I think the novel is what it is. Um, if I were to go back and fiddle with it, it would lose something else in it, right? So it's, it's a novel that some readers would consider excessive, like the Hollywood scene, some people would consider excessive. The rape scene, some would consider excessive. The, the dealing with all different kinds of narratives, some people would consider excessive. But what gives the novel its life and its energy and maybe its flawed character is its excessiveness. And I have to keep it in there. Thank you. I think we can open up the floor now to general questions. And that's, the my, this, that's the best part of the, the day for me. I love talking to the audience. Yeah. Well, I see quite a few hands already. Do you want to field your own, or should I? Sure, we'll start over there. Uh, a colleague has done a study of uh, U.S. high school textbooks. I I'm a loud projector. Oh, you, okay. A colleague has done a study of U.S. high school textbooks, uh, and in some of them, the war is not mentioned at all. In some of them, it's reduced to a paragraph, and he found one where the U.S. won the war. Um, he's now writing a, a book, it's about to come out, um, but he uses the name The American War, and that seems to have become kind of popular in a certain left analysis. I'm just curious about your thoughts about The American War versus the Vietnam War. Yeah, I think that that's true. I mean, for a certain segment of the liberal and left American population, the way that they sort of address the memory of the Vietnam War is to very pointedly say, The American War. So to gesture at the fact that that's what the Vietnamese, victorious Vietnamese in Vietnam call this war, and to point out the fact that this, the Americans are responsible for this conflict, right? So in the introduction to Nothing Ever Dies, I deal with that, and I argue that this is actually still a problem. Because whether we call it the Vietnam War or the American War, what it really does is to repeat the idea that this was a binaristic conflict between two countries, Vietnam and America. And that if we understand it in that way, we can reconcile. And that's the way that Americans have experienced it. So many Americans go back to Vietnam, and they, they say, I was really afraid of going back to, going to Vietnam, and then look, look, all the Vietnamese have just welcomed me with open arms. That's the narrative of binaristic conflict and reconciliation. And what it overlooks is that the war took place in Cambodia and Laos, and it involved all these other countries. And Vietnam wants to forget that too, right? Because Vietnam wants to forget that it itself is its own kind of imperial country with its own imperial past, and that it invaded Laos and Cambodia as well. So, it was really important for me to point that out and to point out that simply calling it the American War doesn't, it may address American ethnocentrism, but it totally forgets the fact, it lets the Vietnamese off the hook for the terrible things that they did during and after the war as well. Yeah. Um, one of the dualities that was that was produced was the duality between the North and the South. And I was just wondering just how real that was. I mean, is there any basis for making that distinction, or was that I mean, simply a product of the Geneva Convention? Well, I think that there is some basis for this idea of a division in regionalism, because uh, when I, I didn't grow up in Vietnam. When I went back to Vietnam to study the language, my teachers would repeatedly bring up this idea that there was a north, a center, and a south with very distinct cultures and dialects and, and characteristics and all of that. So even the Vietnamese people themselves seem to believe that there is this division in the country that's not simply political, I mean, that's not simply induced or imposed because of 1954, but that the Vietnamese people themselves believe the northerners have a certain character, the southerners have a certain character, and the, the history of the war simply seems to have, a, have exacerbated that. And the, fact, and the aftermath of the war has continued to ex exacerbate that because you know, the Northerners and the Southerners continue to hang on to these different, different perceptions of each other, um, the Northerners being the tr traditional ones and the reserved ones and the literary ones and so on, and the Southerners being the lazy, capitalistic, decadent ones. And you know, when I went back to the country, I thought, I'm gonna be a Northerner because I believe in literature and high culture, and, and so it turned out I'm just a Southerner because I'm lazy and decadent and capitalistic. And I like to go to nightclubs and things like that. Um, so these are real, I think these are real uh, divisions that have become embedded 
in the psyche and the geography and the political operations of the country. Thank you. The narrator shows probably for one of the only times in the book genuine sadness and emotion when he's grieving over the tomb of his mother, yet that tomb is fake and that isn't actually his mother. And just that concept of sort of genuine genuine emotion, but yet in a fake fake reality, and yet for the rest of the book we see this real, real reality and a fake character. And I'm just wondering what that scene does to the book, what the purpose is. That was um, one of the, mo the more emotional scenes for me to write in the book, actually, when I was writing that scene. I, was, I almost cried as he cried, you know, because I think that was actually really genuine. And um, he's a really emotionally um, repressed character in a lot of ways. He's had to repress so much of himself to function as a spy and as a mole. And, constantly being duplicitous. So this is one of the few moments in the, in, the, in, the, in the book, and it's always around his mother or his friends, where his emotions get to erupt. And uh, the irony that you're detecting between the genuine quality of the, of, the, of the feeling and the fact that it takes place in this fake setting is, I think, absolutely right. Um, because that's, that's him. The, the only way, he, he can't distinguish anymore between what's real and what's fake, what he genuinely feels or believes, and the, and the production and the representation of history and feelings. And I think that was also part of my own experience growing up as well. I would watch these fake Hollywood movies, and they would produce some real emotion in me. Like when I watch mm -hmm. Apocalypse Now, that also seriously scarred me. I was 10, I think, and I watched it on the VCR, on videotape. You don't know what this is, most of you. But um, I remember, even 10 years later, talking about it in a college class and physically shaking with rage over that movie. So there is a way in which what is fake can still nevertheless produce real feeling. And that is something that I think writers can take hope in, that you know, we're, we're basically fabricating things, we're fabricating stories, they're fake. You know, but we hope that we can induce real emotions, and so that's, that's what happens to him in this fake cemetery. It's just a Hollywood simulacra, but it's the occasion for real feeling. Um, so there is something that is, that is for me, powerful about that possibility that representation can produce genuine emotion and feeling. Right there. this kind of duplicitous in between nature of uh, that's made emblematic in the, the fact that the character is mixed race. And I know, th I feel like that's there is often that sense in a sort of Asian American identity in, in literature, um, but this is the first time I've personally read about it as a literal being mixed race. Um, and I wonder if there is for you a distinction between being mixed race as a metaphor and a reality. Um, so maybe you could speak to that. And then the other question is that it's very clear that you think a lot about the politics of representation in this book. I mean, there's the movie scene, there is the quote, um, that we, we've talked about in, in my class uh, as either from Marx and or Said um, about uh, who can represent who. Um, so I wonder if when you were thinking about, so you said you had this moment of like, oh no, he's a misogynist. Um, how did you think about representing women in this book? Uh, is there a way to undercut the you know, you have the narrator, but then you have the author, and can you undercut a narrator's misogyny as the author? Um, or I'm thinking about sort of a lot of metaphors that are very gendered in the book, and, and um, just, yeah, what, what do you think about the politics of representation of women? Okay. The first part of the question about the mixed race issue, um, I thought about it both as an important, you know, historical reality and also as the metaphorical literary real possibility too, right? So Eurasians and then Amerasians are a crucial, critical part of Vietnamese history, but of, of any place where American soldiers or British soldiers or French have shown up and have either raped or mixed with the population. And the, the outcome of that is you know, a population that is uh, discriminated against by all sides. And that is something that doesn't get addressed very often 
either in American literature or French literature or Vietnamese literature, so I really wanted to foreground that. Um, I knew that I was taking a risk with that for exactly the, the, the implication in your question is, I think, am I exploiting this ex experience of the, mix, of the mixed race person for literary purposes? And of course, if you have any awareness of American literature, you know about the tragic mulatto and the terrible fates that befall people of mixed race heritage who become symbolic of, being, of, the, of the irreconcilable realities of being mixed race and of two populations. And certainly you, that whole Rudyard Kipling idea of East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet is oftentimes visited on mixed race Eurasian or Amerasian characters who suffer terrible things. And my narrator, narrator suffers terrible things. So as I was writing it, I was thinking, oh shoot, not only is he a misogynist, he's also become an excuse for the author to play out these cultural arguments. So I don't know, I, mean, I, I, don't, I hope I succeeded by both acknowledging that, but also not turning him into a stereotype or a tragic mulatto at the same time. And I think that how he isn't a tragic mulatto is that he doesn't die, and that he's imbued with a lot of self-consciousness about his situation, right? And that may be the only saving grace for the, his representation and my representation of women in the book, too, that there is some self-consciousness about their depiction and their objectification in the book. So, there's clearly quite a strand of enjoyment for our narrator in talking about women in a certain way and looking at their bodies. Um, and that's part of who he is as a man. That's part of masculinity for a lot of men as well. It's part of my own masculinity that I had to confront as I was writing the book, that certainly these elements of objectif objectifying women are something that I grew up with and that I internalized as well. And yet at the same time, there's a feminist consciousness that I have that I wanted to try to put into that novel in as realistic a way, of a way as I could, and that was through a character like um, Sophia Mori, who is clearly a feminist, clearly a radical, has books on her shelf that he looks at that he doesn't understand. He doesn't read these books, but he sees their titles. So there's that awareness um, that's interjected in there by his characters. There's no easy answer to your, your basic question, though, about the representation of women, I think, and that's why I felt like I had to write a sequel. I had to put him into another situation where he's going to be, there's going to be more explicit uh, dealings with these issues of Bandung and third world alliances and so on in Paris, but also a confrontation with his own misogyny and his uh, relationships with women uh, where, well, I'm not going to give away the plot, but basically I knew that in finishing the book that I had to go into a different kind of history and it wouldn't be about the Vietnam War, it would be about other things that would allow him to be transformed as a character even more than he's been transformed by the end of the book. I had a very specific question about the scene, um, I think where they assassinate the crapulent major, um, and there's like this very salient image of a yellow happy face that's like splattered with blood. Um, I was wondering, is this a reference to the graphic novel Watchmen? Um, and if so, is it the way, um, is it because of the way that the um, graphic novel engages with Vietnam? Right, um, the typical novelist answer would be to say, yes, absolutely, I foresaw every possibility. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I did, I did read The Watchmen, I did watch the movie The Watchmen, or Watchmen, and there, the Vietnam War comes up in that, right, um, in a very horrible way, in that book too, in, the, in that movie as well. And I don't remember the yellow face, actually, so you got me there. But what I was thinking of, I think, was that you really do see shopping bags with yellow faces on them, and it's, a racial, in, in, it's innocuous, obviously, but in this book it takes on a racial connotation. So I think that was my thinking about that. But thank you. Now I will, I will reference the Watchmen in future discussions of that scene. Of, of us, uh, there were many men who uh, went to Canada and went to jail. One of those was named Muhammad Ali, who refused to succumb to the draft. Uh, you know, the duplicity, we can blame it on the government, but can we, you know, under the fear of being arrested if you didn't succumb to the draft? Um, also, I'd like to just mention two, two movies I saw. One's called Heaven and Earth Change Places about the American War in Vietnam by a woman called Levi Hayslip. They made it out that she was rescued by a GI sergeant. That was not the fact. She was rescued by a civilian. And the other movie was a, a Vietnamese propaganda movie, which I didn't see, called The Bicycle Doctor, where the Amurasian children were used to play American soldiers. Uh, 
I don't really have a question, but the duplicity thing is hard to understand. I'm, I'm a veteran of the American War in Vietnam. Um, the, du the duplicity of the narrator, or? Divorced, otherwise they go after our family. Okay, right. Yeah, no, I understand that. I think that, you know, in my experiences, that there is a diversity of American and Vietnamese experiences that tend to get overlooked in the way that both Americans and Vietnamese have remembered this war. And from the, I'm not gonna talk about the Vietnamese example here, but in terms of the American ex experience, part of how that's happened, I think, is that things like the anti-war movement and uh, people who have resisted the war and fled to Canada and so on have been erased from American memory. There has been a very conscious effort on the part of various interests in American society to recast this war from a bad war into a noble war that went wrong. And the anti-war movement and all of this various related issues that you're talking about is one of those things that has been obliterated in American memory. That There wasn't much room for that in this novel, right? But I do talk about it in Nothing Ever Dies. As for Lily Hayslip and her book, When Heaven and Earth Changed Places, which was made into that movie, Heaven and Earth, one of the reasons why it became really popular was because it emphasized the theme of reconciliation and emphasized the theme of forgiveness. So in the beginning and the end of the book, Lily Hayslip, who I've met and who's spoken to my class, says, you know, you are not to blame. And she's addressing American veterans. And she's addressing um, the audiences in general by saying that we were all victims in this war. And I think that's a very powerful message, and it's not a message that I put forth in this book. And the reason why is because I don't want to give people that easy route out of resorting to reconciliation and forgiveness. And actually, in the middle of her book, she actually says, or actually in one other part of the conclusion of the book, she says, we peasants were what this war was all about. We were the ones who were the victims, but we were also the victimizers. Now that part tends to get overlooked in discussions of the book. And that I think is absolutely, actually the more important message of her book that I, put, that I pick up on and nothing ever dies, that the most difficult part of remembering war for most of us is the confrontation, not with being victims, which we're very easy to, you know, we're, we're very willing to acknowledge our own victimization, but our capacity for victimization, right? And that has been, uh, I think, that inability to reconcile with our capacity to be inhuman and to victimize others is a thing that we have chosen to forget. And I'm not, I'm not just speaking about Americans, but Vietnamese, any, any side that has, forgot, fought, that has fought a war has chosen to forget its own inhumanity. I think there was a question in the back there. I think this is related to the uh, Eurasian question. Um, I was wondering how you chose to make the narrator Eurasian as opposed to Amerasian. And um, if you think that you've already answered it, that's fine. Um, but I was wondering if it's related to my second question, which is what's the role of Catholicism in the novel? Well, he had to be Eurasian, I think, because of the timing of the book. He had to be old enough at a certain point in history to participate in the war and everything. Um, so that meant being, having a French father, right? The, um, the Catholicism is related to that because his father's a priest, and it's related to me because I grew up Catholic. <laughs> I'm not a practicing Catholic, but I grew up saturated with Catholicism. And it's, it's a rich source of literary imagery, of symbolism. Um, there's a rich literary history around it. And it was, it was also some, so it was something that I was imbued with and it was, it was a part of me. So it was very easy to resort to religious imagery of the, of the Christian and Catholic kind in the book. And the, one of the other re dimensions of that is that there's a connection being made in the book between Catholicism and communism. So at a certain, a certain point in the novel, you know, he, has under, he has to undergo the, the catechism, the catechism, the Q&A structure of being interrogated as to you know, who is God that all of us who were Catholics had to, had to deal with. And then by the end of the book, he's interrogated again in the communist vein, and the Q&A mode is repeated at that time as well. So I wanted to draw a connection between these two very different kinds of ideologies that are also based on power, on obedience, on repetition, on submission. And he ends up fleeing one, Catholicism, and running into another, communism. Hi, thank you so much for coming today to speak with us. Um, so we read your novel in our class, in Professor Sue's class, and I ended up talking with a lot of my friends in the class, and we 
um, ended up talking about how the book was very moving, but at the same time, it was very dark in many aspects. And so I was wondering, what was the most difficult thing for you to write about within this novel? Well, as you implied, the darkest part of the book is towards the end, right? Um, when he was, when he's being tortured. I think it's a dark book because I'm a dark person inside somewhere. And I spent, before I wrote the novel, I spent 11 years, I spent my entire lifetime thinking about the war, but 11 years as a scholar, really thinking about it um, really deeply. And it's hard not to see the darkness of this particular time period, both in terms of what was happening to Americans and Vietnamese, but also to Cambodians and Laotians as well. So I had to, I felt like I had to confront that in this novel. And I didn't set out to write a novel that would lead towards this particular conclusion. Um, I had a, an outline of the novel in advance. The ending of the novel was actually at that time much more Hollywood-esque. There would be a big shootout and, you know, mano a mano confrontation and everything. And about two-thirds of the way through the book, I realized that wasn't the ending. The ending had to be this other thing where he ends up being interrogated. And not, only, not just by anybody but, anybody, but by his best friend, his other half, and where he has to confront his own other half internally as well. And that felt to me like that was the right ending, that that was the inevitable ending that he had to go towards. And when he got there, when I had to write that, it was difficult in some ways um, emotionally to do that. I had nightmares for a while when I was writing that. But actually it was also fun in a weird way because it was technically challenging. You know, I, I continually wanted to up the ante as I wrote the novel. I wanted to make the novel more interesting for me to write and hopefully more interesting for readers to read. So by the time we got to the, ending of the end of the novel for three or four chapters, I had to figure out how am I going to make this compelling for the reader? What kind of, what, how can I make it compelling for me as a writer? So that was, a, in, a, in a strange way, a really exhilarating part of the novel to write as well, to try to figure out how to depict torture, how to depict its, its, its experience, how to do something formally different in the novel than what I had done before. Hi, I just have two questions from uh, trying to connect Nothing Ever Dies in your novel. Um, and I think one of the issues Nothing Ever Dies, like you spend quite a bit of time on, is how memories of the American or the Vietnam War, or whatever war you want to call it, has been shaped by American media. Um, and how this has had a disproportionate influence on the memory of the way people remember it. I wonder if you would, how you would see your novel in this light, if your novel is an extension of this trend, because I mean, it is published in America in English, and the extent to which your novel kind of captures Vietnamese voices from Vietnam today or from Vietnam 10 years ago, or people who have been through it in Vietnam. Um, if I may, a second question is something else you dwell upon in your book um, is the idea of ethnicity and an ethnic writer. Um, and I wonder how you would think someone would read your book differently if you had a Western name <laughs> <laughs> or if, like, it is the way. So, well, I think all those issues are actually wrapped up together, you know. Um, when the novel was um, reviewed in the New York Times for the first time, I think in the second paragraph, the reviewer uh, said, he gives voice to the voiceless. And I was like, no, I don't do that. I never make any claim to do that. So why are you saying that I do that? Um, and it was, a, it was a positive review, you know, but it's an easy uh, trope to resort to every time there's a hot new writer of some particular background who's not white. The urge is to say, ooh, he or she gives voice to the voiceless. Um, and it's a, it's a trope that's meant to be a compliment, right? Be saying, you know, this writer has so much talent and he's revealing to us white people, basically, something that we don't know before. Even though, as a matter of fact, if you do a Google search for Vietnamese American writers, you'll find like 10 or 20 within like five minutes. So, and I knew when I wrote the novel that this was gonna happen to me. If I, I knew that if, if, if the novel was any good, this was gonna happen to me. Um, and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it, right? So that's why I had to write the academic book. Okay, so here's another reason why I wrote the academic book. Like in the, in the novel, I can't say, don't read my book in this way, read my book in this other way. <laughs> But in the nonfiction <laughs> book, I can take control, I think, of the critical framework by which this war is remembered and by which this novel should be read. So there's a whole chapter on Vietnamese American literature in this book, which is also a chapter about ethnic or minority literature in, in general, which is saying, don't say we give voice to the voiceless because it's a very dangerous trope that is a trap because it privileges minority writers who become representatives for their communities 
which then allows structures of inequality to remain utterly untouched. Because once you have a voice for the voiceless, you can say, oh, we heard this person, now we, f we can forget about the rest of the population that he or she deals with. So the book itself is totally caught up in this literary industry, which is a part of structural inequality in the United States, which is connected to the operations of war and memory, because these are, you know, whenever we fight a war with somebody, within a couple of decades, we want to hear the voices of the voiceless. So we have Korean American literature, we have Chinese American literature, we have Filipino American literature. All these literatures exist because we fought wars in these countries and created the conditions for bringing these immigrants here into, or refugees into the United States where eventually they would produce a second generation that would write books that would give voice to the voiceless, right? So these, all these things are wrapped up together. And you're right, you know, I mean, as I was writing the book, I was like, oh my God, I am just another American writing a book about the Vietnam War, even if I am a Vietnamese American. I'm not a Vietnamese person, I don't make any claims to be. But I will be treated as a Vietnamese person by this literary industry that won't see a distinction between Vietnam or Vietnamese person and a Vietnamese American. So and there's nothing I can do about that either. Um, so I do, think, I do think about how is this book read in Vietnam by people who can actually read English. There have been reviews of this book published in Vietnamese. There have been Vietnamese people in Vietnam who've read this book in English. So far the reaction has been actually pretty good, I think. Um, that, but that doesn't mean that the book escapes from the basic problem of what you're talking about, that it, it is itself a part of an American memory industry that foregrounds American memories of the war, even if it is minority American memories. And what I say in Nothing Ever Dies is, you can't change this by being a critic or a writer. You can't change the problem of representation simply by producing another representation. You actually have to change the system of representation itself, which is tied in to all these other systems of ownership and production and inequality, which is why you need an entire social and political movement, Bernie Sanders, to change the way <laughs> that things operate, right? That's a facetious answer, but that's, that's partly what he's getting at. A question in the back? You've noted at least one way that writers of color are held to a different sort of standard, that you're meant to be speaking, you know, as the voices of the voiceless at all times. And I think that's very much a trope in the reception of work by writers of color. What other kinds of standards do you think your novel has been held to? I was really um, interested in, in the pushback on the rape scene. Um, there are lots of misogynist narrators written by white writers. Um, do you think that your book has been criticized or held to, to a higher moral standard because you're a writer of color than the writer, you know, David Foster Wallace, for example? Um, is there, do you feel that differential reception in other ways? Well, I, you know, the interesting thing is that I don't read the Goodreads comments on David Foster Wallace, so I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like the professional reviewers, like the book critics and the scholarly reviewers and so on, have not been critical of the rape scene. I've not read that. Um, I think that what Goodreads and Amazon.com does, it allows, it gives voice to the voiceless. All these book club readers and everyday readers who would never be heard in the university audience, for example, now get their chance to say what they like or don't like about a book, right? And so if we were to read the comments on, you know, Philip Roth's writing, we might see a lot of people saying, I don't like that, these particular kinds of representations of women and so on. So I don't know if that has been as much of an issue. I think that um, there is possibly other kinds of expectations that are put on this book around the question of my identity as a minority writer taking on the Vietnam War and questions of race that were raised in your uh, question where maybe I don't get the same, I get some privileges for doing it. I get to be the voice for the voiceless, which is its own little entree into you know being reviewed in the New York Times, but I also potentially get pigeonholed as well for being someone who writes about his experience, and that's a common you know, standard against which writers of color are held, which is why there's no way that in this book that I could overcome that problem because it's still a book about the Vietnam War. And I knew that writing the book. I knew that if I wrote a book about the Vietnam War, I would be talked about as a Vietnamese or Vietnamese-American writer writing about the Vietnam War 
and that would be an opportunity and it would be a closure at the same time. But I had to take that chance to introduce a story that I didn't think had been told before, which is why then it's also important for me to write the sequel to the book that continues this critique of power, but in a different context in France, you know, uh, in the 1980s. And so then we'll see how that book is received, because then I'll be writing something that's not expected of me as a Vietnamese American writer in the United States. And that would be something that David Foster Wallace could do, right? You know, as, as a white writer, you have the privilege to write about whatever you want. Robert Olin Butler can write about Vietnamese Americans and win a Pulitzer Prize for it in Good Scent from a Strange Mountain. Um, but if I were, as a Vietnamese writer, writing about that same subject, I would simply be seen as writing about my own experience. So can minority writers do the reverse? Can I, as a minority writer, write about something that's not about the Vietnam War? I'm going to try. We're going to see how that's received, and then we'll have a, a test case for the question that you're asking. If I actually can ask mm -hmm. a follow-up question to that, because um, Nothing Ever Dies is very much concerned with larger issues of ethics and responsibility, which are basically probed in every instance in this book. And so it brings me to the title, The Sympathizer. Um, you know, what is the object of sympathy here? Because we know from, let's say, Adam Smith and to Rousseau, admittedly, these European philosophers who talk about sympathy in an in a asymmetrical way, that, you know, sympathy is, is, is not so much that you, it's not an outpouring of emotion. It's actually a kind of a stop. It's actually a kind of distance, right? That you are worthy of my pity, mm -hmm. right? So there's always a, a, a slippage between sympathy, empathy, and pity. And so I wonder why when you pick this title, it seems like you are in a novel, you're really exploring putting forth a different idea, right? A different, one might even say a philosophical premise on which to probe what that really means in a world that is so horrifically torn, right? And as, as a permanent condition. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could just say a little bit, maybe segue into Nothing Ever Dies. And sure. Um, well, it couldn't be called The Empathizer. That wouldn't really work, right? <laughs> so. I was stuck with a sympathizer. And so, yeah, I mean, there's all these gradations of pity, sympathy, and empathy that you talk about. And uh, empathy is obviously the gold standard of feeling as someone else or feeling as an other. And in the book, you know, um, I, think, I think that's what he tries to do. He tries to feel for other people. That's his one talent, as he tells us at the beginning. And he can't completely do that. That's, and that's why... By the end of the book, he's confronted with the, in, the, the limits of what sympathy can actually do. As, as a sympathizer, as someone who feels sympathy, he's been a good spy. But there's a limit of action that can take place simply through that emotion. So he goes and he, he, he witnesses this terrible thing that happens. He's sympathetic with the victim of this crime, but he can't or won't do anything about it. So the book does explore, I think, what it means to feel, but the limits of feeling at the same time. And that's the dilemma for uh, the revolutionaries that he thinks about at the end of the book. You know, you feel sympathy for these poor, oppressed people, but then you have to translate that into action. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, all the, all the good feelings, all the good intentions in the world have to be, uh, have to run up against the realities of taking power and trying to make change happen. And that's where corruption and realities occur and where these questions of ethical conduct arise. So again, in, in Nothing Ever Dies, I, I try to make that uh, problem more explicit, to ask whether sympathy and empathy are enough when it comes to the project of peace, of the anti-war movement, of ending war, of engaging in a more ethical memory for recalling the past. And I think my answer is no, it's not, actually. It's not enough to feel. You have to actually do something. You have to engage with power. Uh, it's not enough to write a book, right? It's not an, if, if you want to change the way that memory works, if you want to change the way that the, the conditions by which warfare could happen, you actually have to go out there and turn feeling into action. And that's when ethical compromises or questions of ethical conduct arise, but that's when also we, we have to confront systems of inequality, systems of production, means of ownership, and things like that. Okay. Are there any other questions? There's one in the back. What or how this book would be received, or how to re reflect upon writers of color um, being aware of how that would have happened if the book was a success, which it has been. Um, I was wondering if you were also aware during writing um, 
the novel of how it might reflect upon writers of color had it failed? Was that something at the back of your mind? Um, uh, did you feel as if you were responsible for a larger community of writers? And if so, how did that affect your process? Well, I think every writer who writes a book is aware of failure. It's always lurking. Like, uh, so throughout the book, um, writing the, the book, I was worried about failure. I was worried simply about the failure of writing a decent novel that could be sold and be published someday. And I had to suspend that fear. You know, I had to block that out. Um, and I was pretty successful at doing that. I hadn't been successful before. I'd spent well over 10 to 15 years, depending how I, how, I, how I parse it, I'd spent 10 to 15 years writing a short story collection, which is an absolutely miserable, awful experience. And that was miserable and awful, partially because of the fear of failure and wrestling with failure constantly and worried about how critics might read my writing and so on. So, but for the two years of writing the novel, I was able to spend, suspend most of those issues, except for the moments when I talked to my agent. He was a, he was a very supportive guy, but you know, he was always about, are we going to sell this book? And I was like, I don't want to talk about it whether we're going to sell this book. Or I just, want to, I just want to actually write the book. And you know, the other issue is that I'm a scholar. And I've read many bad novels by writers of color. Um, if you read enough of any category, Asian American literature, which was my first specialty, for example, you realize most of any category is not good. It's mediocre to bad. And so when, you, when I started to write the, the book, I was worried that I would, my book would fall under the category of the mediocre and the bad. And to compound matters, I knew all of the critics who would attack me if that was the, the case. So there was that other element of the fear of failure that my friends would turn on me, you know, for, being, for having the hubris of trying to write a novel and then writing a bad novel. So uh, I hope that answers the question that it was actually quite a frightening endeavor to, to, to try to write the novel. but. Um, I felt that there wasn't any other way, that you know, I had committed so much of my life to the act of writing fiction that I had to take that risk, take the risk of failure, take the risk of uh, <coughs> people that I respected with a great degree of taste about literature and literary history, rendering judgment upon my book. But that was really just a magnification of what all writers undergo, uh, that we always have to confront failure every time we sit down to write something. Can I ask how your family thinks of this novel? Did they read it all along, or? Um, I think, well, I think the first person who read it was probably my sister-in-law, who's a very smart woman and a doctor, you know, and she said, a, it, she said wow, that's a lot of terrible things that happened in this book. Um, I think that my family's proud of it, my brother's proud of it, I think, he, he tweets about it. So that's a good sign. Aww. And then when the novel came out, I gave it to my dad, and it's not that he read it, but he was so proud of it as an object that he wanted to have his picture taken with it. <laughs> and in general, I think that's sort of how the Vietnamese American community has reacted to it. I think a lot of people have not mm -hmm. read the book, but the fact that it was reviewed in the New York Times, that's cool, you know? So people want to take my picture with them simply because I've been reviewed in the New York Times. But when I wrote Nothing Ever Dies, I actually went home and, and before it was published and, and I said, Dad, um, you know, I want to dedicate the book to, to you and to my mother because you, know, you have suffered so much and you've made these, this book possible. And so how should I write your names? How should I put your name in the book? And he said, don't put our names in this book because he thinks the history has not died. That's part of what it means that nothing has ever died. The war still lives for him. He didn't want to be associated with a book about the war. So the dedication of the book is to my father and mother. And um, I think that's part of the reality of what it means for me to have written these books is that I, I touch on these wounds that for my own family are still very vivid especially for my parents. And so I talked to my dad a couple weeks ago and he said, um, you're done with writing books, right? <laughs> uh, you've written enough, haven't you? You should take care of your family now. So th that's, that's, what it, that's what the books mean to them. Thank you, Viet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you too.